Okay. I am now recording, and this is the Collierville Public Library Board meeting, January 26, 2021. Okay, I'm going to go on and call the meeting to order at this time. I have six o'clock Apple time um, to begin our meeting on January 26, 2021 of the Library Board. Okay, and I will call the roll. Dr. Crawford? Here. Ms. Biddle? Here. Mr. Persons? Here. Mr. Stam? Here. Lisa, would you like to check and see if our, any other board members? Oh, Mr. Patton. Oh, no, there we go. <laughs> we'll have to keep an eye on that waiting room. Welcome, Alderman Patton. He has a mute on. Hey, got to remember to push the space button. <laughs> yep. I just called the roll and I will, uh, I will put you in as, as uh, attending. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we want to go on to item number three on your agenda, approval of the minutes from the October 27th, 2020 meeting. Lisa, if you want to see if anyone... Uh, does anybody have any additions or corrections to the minutes nope. from the uh, um, October meeting? No. No. Call for a motion. For... I uh, make a motion that we approve the minutes from the October 22nd, uh, 27th, 2020 meeting uh, without any corrections or additions. Okay. Seconded. Okay, motion carried. Okay, let's go to item number four, introduction and welcome to new library board members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna start by introducing Ray Biddle. She's down there in my left corner. I'm not sure uh, where she is on your screen. Uh, we're so delighted to have three new board members. Uh, Ray, I'll introduce first. Ray was born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. Her parents raised her family to be vigilant readers, building fond memories and a history with libraries that goes back to her childhood. Prior to her move to Collierville in 2017, Ray lived in Houston, Texas for 38 years, working and raising her son. She visited Collierville many times prior to moving here since her son and his family live here. She never thought she would move here, but as a result of Hurricane Harvey, the move was decided. Understanding the magnitude of the change, she realized the up-close and personal feel of small-town living versus the big city, hustle and bustle, get-it-done lifestyle. She realized she loves Collierville and has never felt so welcome living anywhere. She studied journalism and public relations at Kent State University, Ohio. She worked in a variety of marketing and editing roles with Chicago Bridge and Iron, BP North America, and retired after 17 years as CEO program manager and creative director of Watermark Studio and Publishing in Houston. She currently works part-time at Chico's in Collierville. It's the Collierville store, isn't it, Ray? Yes, Carriage Crossing. Lately, she's been helping her granddaughter with her virtual learning with Collierville schools, while her grandson, a Collierville High School graduate, is now an out-of-state college sophomore, also a virtual learner from home. She is an active Library Friends member, library volunteer and is delighted to be on the library board. She stated her reason for desiring to serve on a Collierville board or commission so that she could provide rep representation and leadership in the community, which has welcomed and embraced me upon relocating from Houston. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. And thank you for your willingness to serve on the library board. Awesome. And then I would like to introduce Robert Persons. Robert was born and raised in various military bases in Japan, Hawaii, Alaska, and Virginia. His parents taught him the importance of reading from an early age. He attended the University of Alabama and graduated with an economics degree. He worked in customer service for Delta Airlines for 39 years before retirement. He currently serves as the treasurer of the Woods Homeowners Association. He moved to Collierville from Memphis in November of 2017 he is a voracious reader of nonfiction and has his own extensive collection of Civil War history. He is very excited to serve on the library board and was encouraged to apply by one of our staff members. He hesitated thinking he may not be qualified, 
I assured him that the fact that he is a passionate user and lover of our library makes him qualified. He stated his reason for being interested in serving on a board of commission in Collierville as a desire to serve the community in an area I deem essential in providing educational resources for Collierville school children and provide educational and recreational resources for the adults of our community. Welcome, Robert, and thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you. And then many of you, I'm sure, already know Alderman Billy Patton. Billy Patton and his wife, Dr. Amy Patton, moved to Collierville over 20 years ago, shortly after he was hired by FedEx to work in their new World Tech Center located in Collierville. He has been actively involved in the community and became a graduate of Leadership Collierville in 2008. Currently in his third term as Alderman, Mr. Patton has served on the Collierville Chamber of Commerce, Board of Directors, Bank Corp South Community Bank Board, and several town boards, including the Collierville Beer Board, Design Review Commission, Heritage Commission, Commission, and the Town Library Board. So he's served on the library board previously. He completed an apprenticeship under the US Navy in English Shipbuilding, afterward obtaining both a bachelor's and master's degree in computer science engineering from the University of Mississippi. 1998, he was the recipient of the Richard Grove Award for Computer Science Excellency. Hired by FedEx out of Ole Miss, he was assigned to the World Tech Center in Collierville in 1999. He was named an Employee of the Month for Y2K upgrades in 2000. He founded Patent Computers in 2002 and left FedEx in 2007 to dedicate more time to his business. He also serves as a postmaster of a contract postal unit established in 2008. And we all, I'm sure, have used that, which is very convenient. We love using your uh, really? <laughs> postal station there. The Patton family actively supports Collierville High School Athletics and many other Collierville organizations. Billy and Amy have been married for 30 years and are parents to Emily and William. Welcome, Alderman Patton. And thank you for your willingness to serve. Good to be here. Okay. Um, I guess I can go ahead and and uh, move on to. Did you need to call that item, Andre? You are muted. I didn't know if y'all just want to keep hearing the dog behind me. Uh, <laughs> um, number five is modifications to the policy manual of the Collierville Birch Library. We're looking at materials and collections policies, community serve type of collections, donations public service policies and guidelines, overdue materials, interlibrary loan, technology and equipment policies and guidelines, internet access, equipment use, patron responsibility statements and policies, patron responsibilities and conduct, library responsibility statements, policy and guidelines with the American with Disabilities Act policy and community relations policy and guidelines. Lisa, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we'll go through each of these individually. If you mind, if, if you'll mute until we have discussion. Okay, I will just read the discussion parts just to tell you what we're gonna be looking at. Um, and if you had a chance to look it over ahead of time, as I mentioned in the last, uh, at the last board meeting, I was hoping to go through the whole policy. I was able to get through it and make some of these. A lot of them were just little edits, things that needed to be updated. So here's what we're looking at. Language will be removed in community served section to be more generic. Name of the state library for visually handicapped needs updating. Donations and appraisal section will be revised for consistency. Wording will be added in the overdue material section. Wording updated in interlibrary loan section. Mobile devices added to the internet access section. Patrons are subject to the same policy using those in the library as they are to the public computers. Uh, the rate for our fax service will be added. Patron responsibility section has revisions and additions under beverages, firearms, sleeping in the library, use of restrooms, photographing, videotaping, and recording people. The young children policy has a slight wording revision and addition of Collierville after town regarding liability. Portions of the ADA section will be revised. Wording will be updated in the community relations section. So now I'm going to share the screen so I can bring up the uh, the policy and we can um, we can look at it. And 
and let's see. First one is page nine. So some of this is just taking out language that is very specific that we would have to change on a very regular basis. Um, as I said, I just want to tweak it so we can put it out on our website. I had said that at the last board meeting. I want it printed um, and available for patrons to have access to it. Page nine, change the name of the Tennessee Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped to the correct name. Added a name of one of the uh, prep guide, test prep guides that is available. And we, we know that those first few on those few pages, uh, as you said, it's it's something that would have to be updated. So, for example, the one of the first ones is like 25% or something like that, where it's kind of fluctuating. You don't want to lock a number into a policy manual that would cause us to keep coming back and revising it based on population or collection size or those types of things. Correct? Correct. And I'm going to go back I have to go back to the waiting room and see if there, Cheryl is there. I'm getting iPhone XR. I'm not sure. Um, I'm kind of hesitant about that. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. Um, okay, and again here, this is just wording, basically. Um, donation forms for tax purposes is what it says tax forms. That's not really what it means it's more it's a form that is available for patrons that donate and to use for their taxes so I just that's a clarification um, and then just that some other wording taken out this is a section we revised at the last meeting if you recall for those of you that have been on the board a while um, let me Uh, this section, overdue materials, just um, refers to other days that are closed besides holidays. Our, our uh, courier that takes our library, interlibrary loan books to Germantown Library is only once per week. So that's the reason for the revision there. Um, page 20. Renewals need to be requested for interlibrary loans at least one week before the due date. That's been in place for a while. And it was just inaccurate wording. Better if I go like this. Okay, and then we are on page 26. This was something when we had our new um, adult services librarian join the staff. She was uh, wanting us to add this language. So we provide an open wireless hotspot. I asked Don Petrowski if I could delete that part and he said I could. Um, I didn't think it would be anything anybody would, most people wouldn't understand, maybe Alderman Patton does. Um, patrons using personal computers or mobile devices are subject to the library's policy on public computers and internet access. And what that refers to is on the next page, page 27, sending, receiving, or displaying text or graphics which may reasonably be construed as obscene by community standards. So that would prevent, well, and actually allow staff to stop people from viewing pornography or anything like that, including their mobile devices, not just the public computers. Okay, and then we're on page uh, equipment use has refers to a one dollar prepaid print card. We don't we do not have those available. It was a long time ago that those were available and no longer are. Um, scanning and faxing are not available on our public copy machine. We do have scanning available. We do have faxing now that was just set up a couple weeks ago. Not quite ready to be used, but I, so I took that wording out and added faxing is available at the rate of $1.50 per page. Scanning 
at no cost to patrons. That's how we've had that since the beginning with the scanning and we would like to leave it that way. Um, on page 30, this is in the section on the display art. And again, it's just making the language a little clearer. It referred just to the cases, the majority of our art. We, we do have some cases. It's infrequent that we use them, but once in a while we do. So just to make it more general, because the majority of the art that is displayed is in the hallway, as you know, leading into the Halley room. So I decided the wording there should be display area rather than cases. Some of these are minor, but again, I said I really just wanted to get it cleaned up. And so now we come to patron behavior and patron responsibilities and conduct. Um, this has been our policy for a while that we only allow water and that is town of Collierville, Derek County Cut, the uh, general services director uh, does not want us to allow anything except water inside the building. It, it causes a lot of problems. At some point we may get a coffee shop and then that would have to change. But at this point it's only water. And so again, we're just trying to just make the language a little more clear. Okay, and then um, this section on patron responsibilities and conduct uh, refers to the um, possessing a weapon that is not allowed in public libraries in Tennessee. Now, I believe I, I talked through this with James Llewellyn and I also um, talked to first Captain Albanetti and then uh, Assistant Chief Jeff Ablin. And he was able to find the Tennessee code that refers to libraries because I believe it was 2015 when the state of Tennessee um, allowed handguns to be carried in um, parks and public buildings. But the librarians rose up. So this was already in here that they could not be allowed to possess a weapon. I just wanted to add the prohibition about law enforcement obviously being able to carry it in and we get a lot of state and federal agents coming in using the facilities sometimes to do interviews, just study rooms or a Halley room. And so I wanted that in there. Um, but I also wanted to be able to cite the code where it prohibits the weapons. And so Jeff Ablin was able to help me find where it was referred to. Um, that kind of superseded that um, original law that they had made in Tennessee for public buildings. Any questions on that? I thought Alderman Patton, you might have a question on that. Okay. And the next section is about sleeping in the library. Um, we've had a few instances where we've had to wake people up. We didn't really have a policy on it. So I took this wording from another library policy. It made sense to me. Sometimes, you know, the husbands will go in the magazine room and maybe take a little nap while they're just happen to fall asleep while they're reading a magazine while their wives are looking for books or something. That's not what I'm talking about. We've had patrons just collapse and stay for hours. Sometimes people, um, for example, if you do, there's a book called Library Security, a man named Steve Albrecht who knows a lot about what goes on in public libraries. Sometimes people that are overdosed on drugs will actually collapse as if they're sleeping. And so um, we just wanted to put that in there so that we're covered. Um, we did have an instance in December uh, where a man was coming in and, and using the restroom to kind of take a little bath. And so we added uh, this section as well. Um, the wording about photographing, videotaping has been changed so that it just makes a little more sense. Prior approval is required is what the language was before. And we wanted to change to visitors to the library may not photograph or record um, without such person's consent. Okay, so then we get to the policy on young children and I've spoken to many of you about this and I would like to leave the discussion 
about the age until we have approved this part of the policy and leave it for discussion this time on your other business and then circle back to it at the next meeting or at a subsequent meeting. Um, but there was one thing that was brought to my attention. So we have a couple programs where children are left here that are under 10 without the parents. And so we decided for those programs, for those eight, that age group, we needed to have a permission slip. So that's why we've added this part. And we took out, if the young child is attending a program, the parent will be required to remain in the library throughout the program. Well, we already have a book club for third through fifth graders that Miss Cindy has where the parents don't stay. They, they can leave as long as they're back to pick them up. So we felt we needed to remove that part and add this part about the parental consent and have a permission slip. We'll be able to add that into our registration system where the parents can just click on something and give their consent that they'll be left with the, with the supervising um, librarian. Any questions about that? Took out a little bit of language that just didn't make a lot of sense about encountering doors and furniture. I guess they're talking about really little children um, and just clarified some wording there. Um, again, at the bottom of 36, whenever the supervisor in charge instead of librarian in charge, we just decided to change that. And it referred to the town is released. I decided we needed of Collierville to be added there. And I'm just gonna get a drink here real quick because I've been talking a lot. And then there's some things in the section, the ADA section, where I just needed it to reflect really what we have available. We used to have an assistive technology device that Deanna Britton had added way back in the beginning of her tenure. And I think in 10 years, it was never used. So she had it removed. So this section here is referring to that. And that's why I'm having it removed. Some language that was outdated, I needed to change here. And again, just add some um, clarifying language that made more sense to what we're offering today. We do. In case you weren't aware, um, we don't charge fees for audiobooks and DVDs for people that are visually impaired and hearing impaired, and that was added to the policy. The ending section was about customer service guidelines for interacting with persons with disabilities, and it has, you know, some great suggestions. Some of it may be a little outdated, and again, it, it's more for staff training than to be placed in a policy manual. So I decided, well, it didn't really have a place here. And this last section is just, just a little bit of updating on how we communicate, how we do outreach. We use email newsletters, not print newsletters, libraries, website, social media, those kinds of things for our community relations. So those are, those are the changes. And does anybody have any questions or, or comments about about those. Did you want to call for a motion, Andre, or? Yes, at this time with no discussion, um, can I have someone call for a motion? Motion to approve. I probably need to read, do we need to read the motion? Um, yes, Lisa, uh, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind giving us the rest of it. Since it's sorry about that. Okay, so the motion is to approve the recommendation, re recommended modifications to the Lucius E. and Elsa C. Birch Jr. Library Policy Manual for the materials and collections policies, community served, types of collections, donations, public service policies and guidelines, overdue materials, interlibrary loan, technology equipment policies and guidelines, internet access, equipment use, patron responsibility statements and policies, 
patron responsibilities and conduct, library responsibility statements, guidelines and policies, Americans with Disabilities Act policy, community relations policy, and guidelines. <laughs> I believe Mr. Persons has made that okay. motion that Lisa read all of those parts to the um, modifications again that were being made to the policy manual. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Okay, Lisa, if you want to call roll. I mean, call. Okay. Uh, yep, sorry. <laughs> All right. Alderman Patton. Is that a yes? Billy, yeah, he's on mute. Or yes, okay. <laughs> Dr. Crawford. <laughs> uh, yes. And Ms. Biddle? Let's see, I can unmute her. Yes. Okay. Mr. Persons. Yes. Mr. Stam. Yes. Okay, motion carried. Thank you so much. All right. So I wanted, I spoke to most of you about um, my desire to review the minimum age of children that we allow in the library. And I would prefer to discuss it tonight and then um, come with a recommendation the next meeting or the following, um, if we've had enough time to feel like we've come to an agreement. Um, so let me just tell you where this all began. Um, everybody has said, well, what problems are you having? And my answer is that we're not having any problems with this, but my desire is to be more proactive. And I was reviewing the policy. My gut feeling, I guess, as a mom and a grandma is 10 is a little too young to have the minimum age for somebody to be left behind, potentially for, we were open 10 hours. It doesn't happen, but sometimes we've had situations and I can't you know, say of anything recently. Um, it makes our staff a little uncomfortable. So I, I discussed it with a lot of different people and I, I asked my staff initially and I, I sent you the chart. It was in your packet if, and um, you saw some of the, I, actually there were more people that agreed with me to change it to 12, which was what I was suggesting. But I had some really powerful disagreeers <laughs> and they had good reasons. So I felt it was an, a good idea for us to discuss it. Um, so you can see on the chart some of the reasons um, for keeping it at 10. One of them was a concern about preventing children from coming in who would be responsible. And we were able to name a few. Some of the neighborhoods that are close enough to the library for parents to come, for example, or children to come, for example, on their own and maybe get their summer reading prize, um, you know, sign up for their minutes, which is not not necessary now for the signing up for minutes anymore because we have an app. But there are times when it would be okay for them to just come and pick out a book or, you know, sit and read for a little while. Um, one of our illustrious board members, that would be Dr. Crawford, asked the, you know, good questions. Who's it going to benefit? And who, who might it hurt? So she felt we really needed substantial evidence to support it because as board chairman, and you as board members might have to back it up if a parent didn't like it. And she felt that maybe we were causing unnecessary controversy. I'm not sure if those are exact words, Dr. Crawford, but we had a good discussion about it. She felt we needed good evidence to back up the decision to change the policies so that everybody could stand behind it. Um, you know, a few of my staff members said they felt it was the older the better. The higher we set the age limit, the more likely the child will be more mature, less likely to have incidents and potential liability. Now, if you read through the young children section on behavior and liability, the staff is not responsible for them. It's still up to the parents. They are still responsible having left them behind. So. I, there just aren't that many parents that will do it, but it's allowed. And so some of the things I wanted to share with you were 
these comments, but also what other libraries are doing. Now, Cheryl um, wasn't able to, she was supposed to be here. She might have been that iPhone, but I was really uncomfortable letting her in, not knowing who that was. Um, so um, she gave a lot of good comments. She has middle schoolers, or at least she has recently had them. And so she made some good points. Um, sixth graders are um, 11. And now if, I, if you think about this in a very technical way, a 10 year old would be fourth grade or fifth grade, 11 year old would be fifth or sixth, 12 would be sixth or seventh. And so she felt that usually by age 10, kids were staying at home by themselves possibly. And that is the guideline through the Tennessee court system. And I believe that's where the policy originated. And that was the reason for it. There is no legal age that children can be left home alone. Personally, I, I feel, you know, home is a little different from a public building. Uh, the community center, I did find out, is uh, 12 years old, the minimum age of the community center. But it's also a little bit different environment. So, um, some other points Cheryl made, kids 10 and older are old enough to sit at a table, do their homework. One staff member said, well, what if their parent went to a program in the Halley room and they were just going to sit and read for an hour in the library? So I'm, wel I'm welcoming any comments. Um, and I wondered if you noticed the chart of all the libraries that um, our average age of those 24 libraries or so is just between 10 and 11 for what other public libraries are doing. You have any comments or questions? Have there been any incidences at the library regarding children? Not, uh, not as of late, Robert. Um, you know, Julia pretty much handles things. Um, sometimes kids will get restless. And so it's, it kind of gets noticeable. We, of course, this year has been an unusual year. So they're not recent memories. Now we did have a man who was sleeping in his car and let his kids come in the library and some a staff member had to go out and they must have been less than 10. And uh, so we, we did have him come in and he really just didn't understand what he was doing. Uh, another mother did drop her children off that were 11, but then two kids under 10. And now they do, if there's anybody under 10, they have to have a 16 year old caregiver or older. So that Julia was able to call the mom and, and tell her she needed to come and pick them up. Those are the most recent ones we've had. We used to have a brother and a sister who used to fight with each other <laughs> in the evenings after school. And so, um, my, my main concern would be a 10 year old or an 11 year old wandering off out of view or go through the doors and go outside. And then, you know, the parents come back and start raising cane about where's my child. <laughs> well, and that's on them. Yeah. Okay. And that's the unfortunate part. Mr. Pat, uh, Alderman Patton. Whenever uh, I was a nine year old in Pascagoula. That was where I got my first library card. And uh, from 9, 10, and 11, I learned about Eli Whitney. I learned, I, I loved the biographies and autobiographies. And um, we were allowed to check out six, six books at a time. And I would ride my bike up to the, um, up to the, the library and put a, a rubber band, a big elastic strap around and put them on the back of my car. And um, there are some responsible and I can't, I, other than some late charges, uh, I think I did a halfway decent job, but I don't know if there would be some way that once a year, I don't have a problem with you going up to 12 years of age but maybe once a year having a program put into place that if you were between the ages of 10 and 12, you could come and take a short course, which would be, it would be like a uh, held in the Halley room by a staff member explaining what is to be expected of a 10, 11 year old. 
uh, and that would and you could give them a library card by uh, if they've gone through this course and it could be revoked if they if their behavior was inappropriate, if they wandered off or if they did anything that staff deemed that they weren't responsible enough to come to the library. Um, but, you know, I, I, in fact, if I was to count all of the library books I checked out, uh, in my life, I would say from 9, 10, and 11, then were the years that I had the most books uh, checked out. And so um, I do see where someone would, would say, hey, wait a minute, that's a very impressionable age. And, and I was a latchkey kid, so uh, I stayed at home by myself, and I have five brothers and sisters, and they didn't go to the library, not all of them, maybe one of them. So, um, but anyway, I would I, I think you could you could make an exception if you had a, a course that they could go through and, and <laughs> maybe maybe make the parent attend with them to That's explain, a good idea. Great, like great explain, idea. Explain why that we don't really allow without this course being taken and it only has to be maybe an hour meeting or maybe 30 minute meeting but without this course we don't just let 10 and 11 year olds, and this is why, and you can give all of them reasons, Lisa, that you have, uh -huh. uh, And uh, but it would be by an exception, and there are some exceptions to the rule in that way that they would have to attend this meeting. Um, anyway, I, I, I that's, that's a good, good idea. Good, good idea. Like it. Did you have something, right? I did, but he kind of dispelled where I was headed. I was thinking along the lines that our schools are the safest place, places for our children because uh, the schools took the lead and provided everything necessary to assure the parents that your children are being left with someone in care up through junior high, then it takes a different approach than high school. And thinking about the library being public, that's a lot of exposure. And a lot of people right now consider it to be a safe place because parents are with their children. Once the public really knew that it was open, pretty much a free-for-all, provides isolation, the kids are alone, and most children uh, don't really know how to handle another adult or a stranger without their parents. So that puts uh, risk and liability on the library staff. So I like what uh, Billy had to say a lot because that puts the ownership and responsibility in the hands of the parents. Anybody else? You did say that the library, irregardless of, I agree with what Ray was saying, but the library holds no responsibility if you drop your child off. But you know, you know how that goes with the parents. So, yeah, so. yeah, somebody's right, so, going to be at fault. Right. Yeah. It. Do, it. Do, we are, um, according to the policy, we are relieved of that liability. But mm -hmm. I think there would be the guilt to. You know, yeah. for the library staff, we have a lot of moms, exactly. you know, and they feel uncomfortable. And so, you know, Andre had said, who will it benefit? Well, it will benefit the library staff to the to the extent that um, they'll feel more comfortable, I think. But I like Billy uh, Alderman Patton, your idea. I, um, I think it's a, it would just be a matter of whether or not parents would go for that or not. There may be just a handful that, that would because they really value that idea. Mm -hmm. of being allowing their children to it would really highlight the age i'm not sure most people actually know um what the age minimum age is yeah. to be honest um so having the class would highlight the fact that you know that this is the the minimum age i think um, my my concern is more the extreme side of it so i know if the child was dropped off at the library i you do have someone in the counting doing the counting as they exit or come into the library. Oh, that's but true. Say a 10 year old was to go off into the restroom. I'm more concerned about a sexual predator and, and it's, that could wander off or do something with a child in the restroom where you have no control. No one can 
visually see anything right. going on there. Mm -hmm. A 12 year old would be more inclined to be more knowledgeable about that than a 10 year old would, I would think. Mm -hmm. Lisa, um, is it Julie or Julia that's the children's director? Uh, Julia yeah. is our children's librarian. Would you be able to tell us how she felt about this? Uh, I can tell you that the majority of the staff that works out at the uh, information area, which is all the children's staff, so all the children's staff that we have, Julia, now Linda, Gay, and uh, Cindy Ross, all support raising the age um, because they're the ones that deal with with yeah. the children, including the adult staff, because if, you, if you're not aware, you probably are, that staff works together in a mixed setting oftentimes. So sometimes there is no children's staff around. So I think there was maybe one, uh, one librarian that felt she made some comments about, I think she was hearkening back to her childhood and she is a single mom. So the single moms have a little bit of a different take on it too. Um, but they also recognize that the child and other parents said, it, I could have done it with this child, but not with that child. They, they know their own children. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted the opportunity to discuss so it. And that was part of our discussion. I know, Robert, you were mentioning a 12-year-old might. I think that's what makes this discussion so difficult is that right. not all children are the same. And exactly. It doesn't matter with an age number, um, how, how children would react to different situations or being in the library. So it, it, it is, uh, uh, Lisa, I like the way that we're going to continue to make this discussion and go back and look. I, I did ask Lisa to, to uh, as she had already done, looked at other libraries to see what the minimum age, and it was really 10, 11, and 12 at different places. So um, I think that's something we need to continue to look at and think about as, mm -hmm. um, as we are uh, examining this uh, policy. Sure. Uh, I mean, you've got di children are different, different levels of expectation from them as a parent. I know when I was growing up, the, my main concern, my parents' main concern was unfortunately the extreme because at the time there was a sexual predator picking up small children and some, you know, 10 year old may be perfectly aware his parents may have had a talk with him or talk with he or she and discuss this problem with him, and it wouldn't be a problem for a 10 year old. The other side is, you know, do the parents actually converse with their children on this? Because as we know from statistics, sex is far from on the agenda for a lot of parents with their children. So. so one, one thing that uh, we felt we might want to consider is so sixth grade is uh, well, 11 or 12 middle school is, is kind of the, we wondered whether a compromise at the age of 11 might actually be um, an idea. I think John had maybe mentioned that and I had, um, and Cheryl's comments about middle school, like because I think there's this independence factor with somebody in a child in middle school, and so that would actually, that would actually hit the age of 11. So that might be something that we might consider as well. That's a good idea. Yeah. Alderman Patton, were you going to say something? Yes. Um, my thing was is that um, I, I do see how the value of it, where where you would have a single mother or somebody at the spur of the moment would say, hey, look, I need to one, run to Walmart. Let me go and drop my 10 and my 11-year-old off and how that would be. And I think by having a mechanism put into place where there could be an exception, I don't think that you're going to get more than five, 10, 11-year-olds that will attend a meeting at one point in one year. But mm -hmm. there is a mechanism put in place. If you have anybody come to a school board member or to a board of aldermen and talk about how wrong it is that they're 10 or 11 years. No, we have a mechanism in place, but they have to mm -hmm. attend a course or something like that. There would be, but I don't think very many. I think you would get what you wanted right. at 12, but yet there would be a mechanism put into place that if you were a responsible 10 or 11 year old, and it was uh, not by right, but basically uh, you're granting them the privilege of coming early 
based sure. on having to talk to them, mm -hmm. having to explain that this is a privilege and it can be revoked. Sure. And, and I, I don't think you would have more than probably four or five uh, uh, 10 year olds across this town that their mom and dad would take priority to have them attend this meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether it's once a month or once a quarter or once a, uh, or biannually or what have you. Sure. Uh, but, you know, my concern would be is, is if you have one 10 or one 11 year old that is a big time reader and they get involved in this reading, I'm telling you. Um, yeah. I, I sat at the Crosswinds uh, PTA and watched them, uh, how many books them kids were reading. And I couldn't believe it because I thought I was a reader, but I'm not a reader compared to some of these other kids. So, yeah. but anyway, okay. I, I look forward to the continued discussion on it. I think 11 is a good compromise. Uh, so. Yeah, and I like the idea of considering a course. That's definitely something to run through my staff <clears throat> and uh, see what they think about that. Because I think we have identified that there is definitely a group of kids that can benefit from being here independently. I can't get over the Mid-Mississippi Regional Library System is age six. <laughs> <laughs> that must be. Hmm. Yeah, there were some, uh, well, Emily put this together for me. She found some that were eight years old and then some as high as like 17. And yeah, it was just all over the map. So very interesting. 17, that's, <laughs> that's an adult. <laughs> well, and I think that the, I'm sure they've had, they might, it might have to do with their, with their location. I think that oh, has okay. a, Collierville is a little bit different than some of these other places as well. Okay, well, any other discussion on that topic? Otherwise, I'm going to take us into um, a staff update, and I had, I'm going to share this PowerPoint with you that I had, had sent to you. And I know it's getting close to 45 minutes here. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I had sent you um, uh, kind of an overview of the last half since the last meeting in December. So I'm just going to run through that real quickly here. You can see our monthly checkouts were had gotten up there again, and we were very pleased about that. We did start our online card rene renewal, and that's been very, um, very much appreciated. And then most of you know about our story walk installation, which I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Magazine room is the next thing now. I just talked to Gail today about since we were having more cases and town hall was going crazy with COVID cases and um, and town, you know, had decided to shut down. We, we held off on the magazine room. And so that's the next thing we're gonna be opening up. We've had more and more requests for it. And then I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the trend um, happening in our library. This, this represents the circulation of our print items versus our e-circulation. And you can see that back in 2012, is when we first started with a very small collection of e-materials, audiobooks and e-books. In 2015, you can see it raises up and then especially in 16, and then now you can see where we are in, in 2020. So on the next screen, I'll, I'll show you, uh, or no, I, I'm gonna give you some of these things right here. That's right, it's not, <laughs> my explanation is on the right. Our initial investment, and then the town of Collierville invested in Tennessee Reads in 2015. And then you can see the print trend went downward when everybody was excited about that, those ebooks in the beginning. And in 2019, we did start automatic renewals that bumped up our print, but print has leveled off a little bit. And 2020, our checkouts are down just a little bit, but we, we had about, um, 25% of our checkouts are now represent um, our e uh, products. And in 2021, we're holding steady with that at 20 to 25%. And the main reason I'm telling you about this is just because I'd like to keep you abreast of what's going on in library world. And the next screen, well, there we are. There's an explanation of what was added uh, since 2015, we have, we've added this many um, different financial uh, e-databases. E but the price of going digital is 
it's expensive. Um, so in other words, if we continue to see the trend rising and we need to buy more eBooks, I guess is basically what it comes down to, it's gonna cost us a lot more. So here's the average cost of a hardcover print book, $20, that's our kind of our net price. 385 represents what Baker and Taylor charges for processing the book. And you can see versus what the cost of an ebook is on average, $42. And that's for 24 months of use. After that 24 months, we have to rebuy that book. That's just how the models are set up. Same for audio, but it's a little more expensive. In fact, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, the cost of an e-audiobook, the average, when you consider all the different models, $73. Cost of a physical audio is $43.69. So I tell you all that just so that you understand um, where we're headed and how we might need to be putting a little bit more money into our e-materials if the trend continues to rise. Now the next screen shows you what the nationwide print and ebook and audiobook trends are. And you can see that we're kind of on the mark with ebooks. 25% in 2019, that's when the data uh, was taken, of people read an ebook. And you, if you notice the title here, print books continue to be more popular than ebooks. So I'm encouraged in a way because we're, we, we can spend less and get more for our money by continuing to buy print books. We could just put all kinds of money into eBooks. We'd be spending a lot more and getting a lot less. And so we'll continue to watch these trends and then we will try to have uh, more money allocated toward eBooks if we need to. Um, but I just wanted to share those with you and see if you had any thoughts or comments on, on what's going on in the world and in our library as far as e-materials. I have a question, if you don't mind. No. Nope. Um, I noticed the other day when I, I was looking through a list of new books coming in that had arrived. How do you decide how how you split the uh, versus audio versus print? Because I noticed that a book I was interested in the only the only version that was available was the, was the uh, the ebook and not the print. And I'm just curious how you decide. So in those statistics that I was showing you earlier, we invested in 2015 in uh, Tennessee Reads. Tennessee Reads is a consortium. And through that consortium, we have access to a lot of eBooks. All of our print books are our own. Collierville owns them outright. And we share the eBooks. So this, at the state level, they're making the majority of the decisions for the e-material. We have a small amount of money. It's about, um, the BMA just gave us a little bit more money. I think it's 25,000, I'd have to check, to put toward buying additions to what the state is offering us through the consortium. So we have, it's called an Advantage account. And so most of what you're seeing it that is now in our catalog is through Tennessee Reads through the consortium. Some of those are ours alone, but most of them are shared throughout the state. So that's those decisions, the majority are made at the state level. Oh, okay. Thank and you. you know that you can request books. Um, and most of the time, the librarian that's buying the nonfiction is me. So <laughs> <laughs> I like to cool. honor those whenever I can because um, we have, we have a, pretty generous budget and uh it's it's just in our best interest to buy what collierville patrons are going to read so well in, is, in 11 12 and 13 was when i served my three-year stint on the library board we, we were we, we were grasping to do ebooks back then because we didn't we couldn't see there was a very disparity of it everybody wanted to stay with the hardbacks and we didn't believe that we'd ever see the day we'd get up to 25%. Uh, I can remember going through and we didn't spend a whole lot to begin the, to, to begin and get on eBooks, but I'm surprised we're at 25%. I think that's awesome. I think I was just curious about uh, 
when you talked about after the, the what was the two years or 24, say the 24 checkouts, and then you have to re repurchase the book, if there's any way to track the uh, actual checkout of the eBooks versus, uh, you know, if it starts decreasing down to one or two copies, maybe a month, maybe not to renew it. Right. And that's that basically what Stephanie does. Stephanie uh, Roland is our digital services librarian right. and she's constantly monitoring that. So that, okay. and that's an advantage in some ways, Robert, because we can decide we just don't need to buy that again because right. it's not circling. That's exactly okay. how she does it. That's exactly okay. how she does it. <laughs> Thanks. She has, it's all, uh, it's called Overdrive Marketplace and we can go in and we get all that information right there in the, where she can just click and see, you know, if it has any holds on it, right. how many times it, how many checkouts it has. And that's exactly how she decides whether she's going to rebuy it or oh. not. Okay. Right. So, Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so I, uh, I included in your packet um, a couple more documents about the story walk. Um, and by the way, we uh, if you've looked at this already, you see that we've gotten tons of great comments. And our newest story walk is, of course, the snowy day. And Stephanie was able to go out there on the day that it snowed and get a picture of the snowy day in the snow. It almost looks like the ocean behind there. Yeah, really. But, <laughs> um, yeah, what a beautiful little shot of that. It's been so exciting. And people are really, really excited about it. And we are too. And we have a very enthusiastic uh, children's staff that just loves to uh, put this out there. But I wanted to share the history. I had Julia write out the history because I said, this is the kind of thing that we need to write it down. What's the history? How did this come about? And we had to come up with an agreement um, because public services, um, general services, I guess, actually is really what it is. And she has public services here, um, have agreed with us that we will take care of the cleaning and they will maintain the grounds around because there are 20 signs that they have to mow around. And I did, I was able to come to an agreement with Derek Honeycutt about that, but we decided to put it in writing. And so that going forward, Everybody knows what everybody's responsibilities are. And the last library board meeting, um, there was a suggestion made that we possibly, because we were doing Polar Express, which emphasizes Christmas, that maybe we consider uh, books about other faiths. Um, and I decided what we needed to do was come up with a criteria, because while that's a good suggestion, we do feel like there needed to be criteria for the book itself, rather than just targeting toward a topic, we wanted to make sure it was good literature. So that's what um, the criteria uh, we established um, with a discussion with the staff um, that we we're aiming toward high quality children's literature, award winners preferred, um, and you can read the rest of the criteria. Now, if there is a religious book of anybody's religion that meets the criteria of being high quality literature, then it would be considered so that was why I wanted to share those documents with you so you knew what the status of all that was. Any questions about that? Are you, um, are you able to get volunteers to take the load off of the staff in terms of cleaning the signs? So far, we've had enthusiastic staff uh, <laughs> doing it. Uh, they actually kind of like getting out for an hour. It's once a week. Um, Julia, you know, she, she's a pretty hardy person from Northern Illinois who grew up on a farm and um, they've all been great. And so at some point it is, I believe it might be one of the teen volunteer duties, but I don't know that we've had anybody volunteer for that yet. Uh, we haven't been accepting as many volunteers because of COVID. And so once we start getting more volunteers, it's possible that um, we can assign that as a volunteer activity. We do want to make sure it's quality work because, you know, the college, town of Collierville has very high standards for its parks. And so we want to make sure that we're meeting that standard. And as I said, some of the staff is enthusiastic about getting out for an hour and just getting a little fresh air. 
Okay, so just an update on COVID. We, we were on hold the magazine room, but we're ready. And then Thanksgiving, we were ready. Thanksgiving came and the numbers cases rose. So we're gonna get back to that. As you know, we were closed there for a while after Christmas. We did curbside and that was a challenge for our, for our staff. Um, I did have a comment from a patron requesting the library be open that was sent to Stan Joyner, the mayor. And I responded very enthusiastically that we were very ready to be open. We were just waiting for the okay to do that. We limited it to five checkouts. And I actually thought we were gonna still be doing curbside when I had this meeting. And so um, that's why I'm sharing this with you. Some nice comments about the curbside people really did appreciate it. Um, but we are happy to be back open again. It's safer for our staff. I did have um, a concern about a, a, the staff members walking outside and having to go up and down the curb and um, it's just not our normal service model, so. Well, I can tell you from using it, it was, I appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. All right. And then I wanted to let you know about the donations uh, from the last quarter. Um, as you, most of you know, if any of you read the minutes, I had changed this, the policy or the procedure really on accepting donations. The BMA has to accept the donations in order for them to be, you know, put in our budget. The library board, I think it was, we realized it was May language in the state bylaws. So I decided to make it more efficient. We would accept donations at the BMA level. And I would, I would tell you, in fact, I think this was accepted last, at last night's meeting of the BMA, where normally we would have to wait till after the library board meeting. And sometimes there wouldn't be library board meetings. And so um, it's just more efficient this way. Just some programming notes coming up. Um, we're still doing virtual story times. And Julia has enlisted a Bright Star Touring Theater for a live performance of George Washington Carver and Friends. And there's a soap bubble circus coming. We're, we'll see what that's all about. Um, they don't have a date for that yet. And they're in the middle of planning summer reading. And here's what's going on with the young adults, the teens. Blind date with a YA book. And here are our stats from the virtual volunteers. We have 18 teens actively volunteering in the program out of 27 who originally signed up. And you can see the numbers there. We had an enthusiastic group in the beginning. Tailed off in December, not surprising. But they seem to have a pretty good active group doing lots of activities virtually. A couple things that are coming up with crafts seem to be the, the thing to do with COVID because we can make little kits and have people pick them up. Sometimes have small groups getting together. We have three online book clubs right now. Um, and this is, you know, we have some staff that's really interested and so that's what they're working on. And we've uh, partnered again with the Master Gardeners and they are uh, putting on a whole lot of classes. There was one this last Saturday for us and uh, those are always enthusiastically attended by a good crowd. Our new adult services librarian has organized a really nice slate of technology classes. She's gonna take people through building a website, Gmail, Google Drive. She, her mom does genealogy, so they're gonna do that. Anyway, you can see the list there. And then um, we've had a, um, actually, I think it's a mother-in-law of one of our employees who works for this organization called Maz Resources. And Dr. Crawford, I don't know if you've heard of this. I thought of you. It's an educational service that equips individuals of all ages and abilities to self-manage. And she's been doing quite a few um, sessions on Mondays. So you can see what they are there and some of the things she's covering. And then some miscellaneous Spanish classes and more crafts and meditation, things like that. And this is for all ages, love at first page, sharing an original video, recommending your favorite read to fellow Collierville Library book lovers. And you can submit it via Facebook or Instagram. And then there's some prizes. Two new resources. We have just added a financial database called Weiss Financial Ratings, where you can check the values and ratings of stocks, mutual funds, and exchange traded funds. We'll be doing some programming around this too, where the, the vendor actually has a representative that will come in and teach people how to use it. They can use it to compare Medicare supplement insurance plans. 
Um, it's a very conservative uh, service. Their, their ratings are conservative. So, And then we just had installed our fax, uh, fax service. It's a cloud-based faxing. And the area businesses charge anywhere from 50 cents to 249 and ours is going to be $1.50. We just kind of settled right in the, kind of on the low end, but um, not as cheap as patent computers. <laughs> and do you get a lot of people, Alderman Patton, is he still there doing uh, faxing? We, we do. And uh, we send a lot over to you guys and we tell them, you know, you can go over there and they, there's a lot of people that come in that don't know about the, the services that are offered for the library. And so uh, we need what we need is some uh, laminated placards that we could give to area businesses that says, here, you can go to the library and do this. Um, Absolutely. I like that idea. We're going to do that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And uh, you know, we like partnering with businesses and just becoming their friend because we think that that's a, a great, a great um, outreach for us. But, but y'all do fax by email. See, we don't like people to come in they, and do fax because we don't have it set up on a, uh, a cloud base. So we would have to set up an email and they may send you who knows what kind of junk and then what, whoever they send it to, you'll get return responses to if it's not cloud-based. So we don't have cloud-based. So we right. tell them we won't allow them to do facts by email. They have to come in and hard copy it. We do right. allow them to connect to the email and print it out so they can fax it. So, but okay. this is a better service where you can fax by email. That's great. Yeah, so we're just waiting for our coin machine money uh, to get through finance. So that's the only thing we're waiting on. Um, and it was actually just a, a slight addition to an already existing document station that we use for scanning. So it's, we're hoping it works. <laughs> we'll see. We're always worried whenever we add something new, how, how is this going to work? And let, well, um, let me know if you want us to go up on our rate so that we can drive it back to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll think about that. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, that's that's the other things that we offer at that same location, as you probably know. I think, Ray, you've come in and used some of those services before. Mobile printing was recently down. It's back up and running again, if anybody is needing that. And I just wanted to point out to you, we have six new staff members since June. Julianne Jorgensen, Deja Bolton, she's our teen services person. Emily Baker is up in the right-hand corner. She and Sue actually came from Germantown. And we have Christian Stewart and Linda Gay just joined us a couple weeks ago. We are now fully staffed for the first time since Deanna Britton left um, her position. So we're very happy. We have, we have a great staff. On Monday, this coming Monday, we're going to be doing some training. That's the staff training with uh, Collierville Police. They're always our friend. Whenever I ask them to do anything, they are right, Johnny, on the spot. They are going to do active shooter training. Hope that, again, this is preventative. We hope it never happens, but we want to be ready. We've had it before. It's time to revisit that. And we also are going to include uh, crisis intervention training this time. And the reason for that is because sometimes we get people in the library that make some of the staff a little uncomfortable. And usually I end up calling somebody, um, one of the detectives, I think I talked to Ben Wardlow, Captain Wardlow um, this time. In December, we seem to get them for some reason. I guess it's cold and it's kind of a hard time of the year when people are struggling with mental health issues. And I know that they have a team there that's trained to deal with that. And so I felt it was time, we've never done that before, um, to get some training and just some advice on, on how, to, how to view those people and how to handle them. So we're looking forward to that. That's Monday morning, bright and early, 8 a.m. to 9.30 at, in the board chambers. On That's the only place we can meet with and get everybody in. Uh, our entire staff is 23. And so I thought I would kind of end on uh, this picture is, this was from uh, Karen. I know Robert knows Karen pretty well. She is, she's a great person to get to know people personally. She has a great personal customer service touch. And so there she is in the snow 
delivering books for curbside service, then I just thought that was priceless. She's a godsend. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> she's, a, she's a great employee. She's been here a long time. So I thought this was a great quote. Libraries are essential for the health of our democracy, our communities, and our future. And we were very grateful that the town of Collierville um, all board, BMA decided to keep us all on because maybe some of you are aware that uh, many library employees were furloughed and Germantown's, the majority of their staff is still furloughed. And the Memphis libraries are still only open 10 to 6 Monday through Friday. We've been fully opened and keeping everybody working and we're very grateful for that because we were considered essential and, and I think most of our community users would agree. So the last thing, I did not include this in your packet because I just found out I need to, to uh, present to the BMA coming up in the next couple of months here and some of the things on my, on my list that I'm gonna be working toward just so that you know um, our vision, of course, for the library is an addition. And these are some of the things I'm gonna emphasize that have already been emphasized in the plan. And the things that we need to do in the meantime to build a bridge to that vision um, the biggest thing is improving our checkout process by considering adding RFID technology, some new self-checks, and Mr. Mr. Alderman Patton uh, mentioned some of the marketing. I, I love that idea, and I, I need some more ideas like that to get the word out about all the great services we have. Um, so there you can see some of the other things that I'm considering. There's a couple building improvements. One of them is... Um, Derek is going to be asking for the BMA. I just talked to him this morning to see about getting the library flooring replaced. We have, we have a lot of trouble with the carpeting buckling and they used to cut it and glue it. They can't even find anywhere to put glue anymore. It's all just falling apart. So it's a security and safety hazard to have the carpeting buckling underneath. And then one of the things I would really like to open up is the opportunity for people to donate easily to the library and I have to explore ideas for that so that we can start saving our money for our new building. Um, and so I, I talked to Lisa Wells a little bit about that today. That's all I have. And uh, so I thank you for your attention on, um, we went a little bit past seven. But any questions or comments about anything you saw there? I know there's still the architect plan for the addition somewhere. I have it. It's right here in my office. Yeah. Lisa, <laughs> I, Lisa I look forward to hearing uh, when you meet with the BMA about the additions and where you give yourself in a three to five year plan of the need with if we go further on in this pandemic uh, as far as meeting spaces and open spaces and what have you. There okay. you go. That's the doors open. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I'll be calling you. <laughs> yeah, meeting spaces. And so that's the, that is, you know, I wish we all had the crystal ball to see how, how long this is all going to, going to last. And, uh, you know, an outdoor space behind the library would be really nice now. You know, we've talked, we talked about that many times this, this summer. How nice it would be to have an outdoor space for us to have some programming that could be a you know collaboration with the parks um you know and so that's that's one idea for you but um i'll work on that looking forward to it okay all right that's all i have thank all you right. for all the, de the details lisa very nice really thank you. Yeah. Yeah. thank you you're welcome. Great My pleasure. Meeting. Thank you for coming and taking the time to be be here and participate on the board. We really, really appreciate your care and concern for the library. I we had some, you know, uh, we had a few applicants, and I I said this person needs to care about the library. Um, that's that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Well, great meeting, and we will call this meeting for an adjourn adjournment at 714.